questioner was asking about a remark I made in one of my books that Christians who want to learn about the nature of God would be better advised to read the works of Christian philosophers than Christian theologians. Uh, and he asked me whether I still feel that same way, and I, I do. I, I certainly do feel that way. Contemporary theology has been largely shaped by continental philosophy, European continental philosophy, which for whatever other merits it has, is characterized by a very vague and sloppy style of argument. Uh, and they ha as a result, contemporary theology has largely lost the standards of clarity and logical rigor that it once had uh, in its classical uh, times. Uh, however, this fallen mantle has been picked up, I think, by a new generation of Christian philosophers in Anglo-American philosophy. And over the last 40 years, there has transpired something of a revolution within Anglo-American philosophy uh, where some of our very finest philosophers at our best universities in this country are now outspoken Christians and are using the tools of analytic philosophy to explore not only the traditional questions of God's existence, but questions of Christian theology, writing on uh, articles like, uh, writing articles on subjects like uh, the eternity of God, uh, the filling of the Holy Spirit, petitionary prayer, uh, the atonement, and things of this sort, issues that are usually reserved for systematic theologians. And this work I have found personally to be extremely fruitful and helpful. Uh, and uh, I, I hope that whether you've agreed with me or, or not tonight, that you've found this sort of interaction at least stimulating and, and helpful in the same way. Yes. Thank you. Michael. Uh, let's start before the universe began to exist. Let's grant that's true. Let's be clear what, what's being asserted there. What's being asserted is that the spatial temporal realm in which we are a part began to exist. Right? You wouldn't want to interpret this as saying the total material world that ever may be began to exist, because certainly there's no evidence for that. And also, suppose that our spatial temporal realm began to exist. Now, it would seem there are three possibilities. One was existence was on call, wasn't it? Another one was caused by uh, an agent of intelligent being. A third was it was caused by an earlier physical realm. And in fact, there was a spatial realm. Because there's no inference from the conclusion that our spatial temporal realm began at a certain point, there was no earlier spatial temporal realm. I mean, for example, you would surely concede that God could create any number of spatial temporal realms succeeding one another. And so, the end of a given, I mean, the beginning of a given spatial temporal realm need not be the beginning of space time. Well, if that's right, then the question is, what, where in your argument have you ruled out the possibility of our spatial temporal realm could have been caused by another earlier spatial temporal realm? Well, in effect, I think, Michael, that is exactly what the oscillating model of the universe wanted to say is that our spatiotemporal realm was the product of a previous spatiotemporal realm. Uh, and that model doesn't work because you can't pass through a, a singularity. Uh, it represents a boundary or an edge to space-time. So the only way you could appeal, I think, to some kind of wider physical reality would either be by postulating some kind of metaphysical time that is beyond physical time and space, as Arnie was talking about, or else talking about some kind of higher embedding dimension uh, in which we're embedded. And I, I think that for the naturalist, the first alternative isn't a very reasonable one, because uh, for the naturalist, the, the spatiotemporal universe, the physical realm, just is all there is. And so it would seem uh, groundless to posit some sort of a, a metaphysical time. I, as a theist, posit that because I believe there's a God who is conscious and active and therefore could exist prior to the universe, though I don't think he actually does. But he could if he were doing things or thinking discursively. But for the naturalist, it would be hard to see what motivation he would have for that kind of metaphysical time. And as for the embedding higher dimension, um, I'm not... I'm not sure that would work because I think that implies a tenseless theory of time. That is to say, if you have a higher dimension in which our space-time is embedded, 
then that means that our whole space-time must exist. And, and as you know, I don't think that's right. So I guess I would think theism would be more plausible than these views. But let me, let me say, though, I think that the, the way in which you're arguing would be the most powerful type of objections, namely to bring metaphysical objections rather than scientific objections. And so I think that is the, the most significant question marks that could be placed behind the sort of inferences I'm drawing. Yes, this gentleman back here. Uh, it seems that what you, uh, I'm a little bit confused about. A little louder, please. I'm a little bit confused about the notion of the, uh, the, the personal aspect of this agent. Right. And also the implied enormously powerful. What I sort of envision is an unintentional, perhaps, a, a cosmic hiccup. Uh -huh starting things off, uh, and maybe the pre-universe was pregnant enough with possibility that the touch of a flea would set it off. And I was just, uh, it's not scientific. Yeah. Well, see, that's the problem. You've got to give some kind of scientific model for how that would work. The, this hiccup idea is very much like the vacuum fluctuation model. There are these hiccups in the in the wider vacuum that produce universes. But I explained the problem with that. So I think that the, the personality of the cause follows from the three arguments that I gave for it. Uh, namely, that if there is a first state of the universe, it can't have a scientific explanation in terms of laws and initial conditions because there isn't anything before it. So you'd have to have a personal explanation. Secondly, that the only things we know that can exist timelessly and spacelessly are either minds or abstract objects, and abstract objects don't stand in causal relations. And then this idea that only an agent cause endowed with free will would have this kind of spontaneity that you speak of to originate a temporal cause from an eternal, uh, uh, rather a temporal effect from an eternal cause. So I think those give us three good reasons to think that this is a personal creator. Why do you associate the, the word extremely powerful with the instigation? Well, because uh, it created the universe out of nothing. I, I'm being modest here uh, rather than saying omnipotent. I'm just saying extremely powerful. M certain medieval theologians argued that any being that could create out of nothing would have to be omnipotent because there's an infinite distance between being and non-being. And so any being that could create out of nothing would have to have infinite power. Indeed, when you think about it, it's hard to imagine how there could be any greater power than the ability to create out of nothing. That would seem to be maximal power. How could anything be greater than that? So it, I, I think we could say a maximally powerful being, but I, in modesty, just say enormously powerful. <laughs> I think that's enough. Let me take someone who hasn't asked a question yet. Uh, yes, this gentleman. I think it was response to Arnie's question that made the point that um, infinite regress into the past yeah. isn't possible. But yet, don't we really run into the same problem with this creator that you posit? Because it had it had a moment in time, and um, so why why don't we run into the same problem that uh, the the creator uh, can't yes. be infinite? Again, another way I'm at, what I'm asking, I guess, is that. What properties of the universe do you see now that cause you to, um, to ascribe to this creator uh, an eternal nature? All right. The reason that I think that the uh, creator wouldn't exist through an infinite uh, regress of events prior to the beginning of the universe is because of the philosophical arguments that I give against the possibility of an infinite temporal regress of events, which has not been discussed tonight. That wasn't the topic this evening. But if you're interested, please buy my book, uh, The Kalam Cosmological Argument, and you'll see that. You're saying that God is not eternal, though. No, I'm saying God, e, the word eternal is ambiguous. It can either mean timeless or it can mean everlasting throughout time. And so I'm arguing that the creator is timeless without the universe and eternal in that sense.